you have your Bibles with you tonight, turn to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 3. If you like titles, I entitled this message, The Slippery Slope of Sin. The Slippery Slope of Sin. You don't have to be saved very long to know that something isn't right in what you're doing. My wife was raised in Catholicism and when she got saved, she got saved five years before I did and uh, I told her that I wouldn't marry, I wouldn't marry a Catholic and, and I, I wasn't nothing but a heathen, I wasn't even saved <laughs> but, but uh, we got ma married in a Methodist church but when she got, she got saved, like I said, five years uh, before I did. And when she got saved, she thought that she would never sin again. Thought it was, oh, boy, I'm glad that's over. I'm, I'm not going to sin anymore. She didn't, didn't take her very long to find out that that wasn't, that wasn't the case. All of us sin. I, I want to look at this passage of scripture tonight and then I want to give you 12 things that we can, how we can know we're either backslid, backslidden or, or backsl, backsliding or have already backslidden, okay? Yeah. We're, either, we're either going to do it, we are doing it, or already have done it. But one of those cases there in... Uh, that that uh, shows that I better be careful. And, you know, as I as I was studying this and, and reading down through there, there was quite a few of them that I'm that in the present tense in my life. And uh, uh, when when that happened, we we can know, but we better do something about it. Amen. So so I want you to listen. Up, but we're going to read here first in. Uh, uh, Jeremiah chapter 3, then we'll have a word of prayer. The Bible says there in uh, Jeremiah 3, and verse six, starting in verse 6, The Lord said unto me, In the days of Josiah the king, hast thou seen that which... And, and just in this short passage of scripture, I think it's six or seven times the word backsliding is mentioned. The Lord said unto me, In the days of Josiah the king, hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done. She has, gone up, she has gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree. There hath played the harlot. And I said, and I said, after she had done all these things, turn thou unto me, but she returned not. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce, yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. Now, keep in mind that, that Israel at this time, that was the, the wife of God. That was considered his wife. Verse 9. And it came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom, that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and with stocks. Now here we're talking about, about spiritual. That she uh, whored them and don't spirit. She went to other gods, take, uh, trusting in other gods. Verse 10. And yet all this, her treacherous sister Judah hath not returned unto me with her whole heart, but feignedly saith, Lord. And the Lord said unto me, The backsliding Israel hath justified herself, more than treacherous Judah. Verse 12. 
Go and proclaim these words toward the north, and say, Return thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you. <coughs> Excuse me. For I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. Only acknowledge thine iniquity, that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God, and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree. And ye have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you. And I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. And I will give you, and I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And it shall come to pass when you be multiplied and increased in the land. In those days, saith the Lord, they shall say no more, the ark of the covenant of the Lord, neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall they be done any more. Verse 17. At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered unto it to the name of the Lord to Jerusalem, neither shall they walk any more after the imaginations of their heart, evil heart. And those days the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel, and they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given for an inheritance unto you fathers. But I said, How shall I put thee among the children, and give thee a pleasant land, a goodly heritage of the host of nations? And I said, Thou shalt call me my father, and shalt not turn away from me, Surely, as a wife treacherously departed from her husband, so have ye dealt treacherously with me. O house of Israel, saith the Lord, a voice was heard upon the high places, weeping and supplications of the children of, it, of Israel, for they have perverted their ways, and they have forgotten your backsliding, or forgotten the Lord their God, Return, you backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord from the multitude of mountains. Truly, in the Lord our God is the, is the salvation of Israel. Verse 24. For shame hath devoured the labor of our fathers from our youth, their flocks and their herds, their sons and their daughters. We lie down in our shame, and our confusion covereth us for our youth even this day and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here tonight. Father, I just pray as we look at this situation that Israel and Judah found themselves in. Father, backsliding, going away from God, worshiping other false gods. Lord, I just pray that that we might learn some lessons tonight as we look at these causes and what we can possibly do about them. Father, that when we find ourselves in that situation, when we find ourselves starting to slip, Father, help us to go to the Word of God, listen to the Holy Spirit of God as He speaks to us through Your Word. Father, that we might turn from the way that we're going and turn toward back towards You. Father, we just give you all the praise and glory. Thank you again for the opportunity that we have to be here tonight. In Jesus' precious and holy name I pray. Amen. So we find, find here that, that Israel is, is continually backsliding. And God would beg them to come back. And refer to about being his, his uh, wife and so forth. And, and they just continued to do that. Content, time and time again. You, you would think that, well... I, I was going to say, you, you would think that, that people would learn. But we do the same thing today, amen? amen. So, <laughs> you didn't have to say amen because I, you know, I, I did. <laughs> but, but we find ourselves doing the same thing. We, so, so, we'll do something that 
we know that it's wrong and start going in that direction, the Holy Spirit of God will speak to us and, and we stop and, and, and ask God to forgive us and He does. And, but we find ourselves maybe, maybe an hour later going back trying to do the same thing again. And, and they had a difficult time <coughs> of, of serving God. In John 7, 17, 20, the Bible says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through thy word. I'm glad today that I have a, that I have a God, that I have a Father in heaven, that I have Jesus Christ, that he prays for me. Aren't you glad about that? God, God knows everything about every one of his children. And the Bible tells us that he prays for us. Praise for us. And talking about here where, about the apostles that I've prayed not for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, through the apostles that they was preaching the gospel. And then, then eventually it came to us and we got saved. And he's talking about that time I pray for these. God's praying for you. That, that, that just, that makes me want to jump up and down and shout. Amen. That I know that God knows me well enough, knows that I'm saved, and that he's praying for me. What a, what a God that we have. The Lord today is our intercessor. He prays for us. When, when we got something going on, He prays for us. You know, the Bible tells us that sometimes we don't know how to pray, but the Holy Spirit of God will pray for us. Isn't that great? I love that. And you, <laughs> One thing I can be sure of, that if God is praying for me, and that God prays in a specific way, I believe that, that His prayer is answered. Amen? And, and I, I know that I'm saved. I, I was saved September the 23rd, 1979. I know that I'm saved. I got saved then. I'm still saved. I'm going to stay saved till I get to glory. And, uh, but I'm, I, have, I am secure in Jesus Christ. I don't, I don't worry about if, uh, if I'm going to do something that, that can make me lost. I know that I'm in the hand of God and nobody can take me out of God's hand, not even myself. I can't take myself out. You can't take yourself out. If you're saved, you're slave. You better get used to it. Amen? God, you're going to stay saved. <laughs> we fail, but God never fails. Some, sometimes, boy, you ever find yourself in seems like that everything is going wrong? Miss Barbara mentioned that early. See, well, just one thing after another. Amen? Just things happening. And, and we don't have any control over it. But our God does. Amen? Amen. And we know that, that He does. If you belong to Him, He's already prayed for you. Already and continues to pray for us. I thank God for that. In 17.9, our Lord prayed to the Father. He said, I pray for them. I pray not for the world. But for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Praise God. He prays for us. We belong to the Father. We pray. He prays for us. He died for the world. But he, he does not pray for the world. He prays for, for us that are in the world. That, that, that we will, God will help us in, in our way that we walk each and every day. He, he died. The Lord Jesus Christ prayed for me today. Now you... you Get up, get up tomorrow morning. Pray that you get up tomorrow morning. And uh, the first thing on your mind, know that Jesus Christ prayed for you. Isn't that amazing? When, no matter how my day goes, I know one thing for sure, that Jesus Christ prayed for me and he wants me to go the way that he would have me to go that my life might be pleasing to him uh, that I wouldn't backslide that I wouldn't get off on this tangent or go in this direction or that direction but God prayed for me you know someone said that for someone to pray for someone else who's having a difficult if that person has experienced I'll give you an example. If, if I had, if I had uh, cancer and, and went through all the, the stuff that you go through, I've, I've never had cancer, but I'm just using an example, that, that went through all the, the chemo and the radiation and everything about that, 
and God, God took care of it, healed me, and, I, and I'm doing fine today. And if, if I know someone that has cancer, I would, it, would be, it would be beneficial to them for me to go there and tell them what I've been through and what God has done for me. Yeah. Fellow tells, tells a story. He says, uh, the young preacher tells the story, he's just a young fellow at the time, he says, of a drunk whom he tried to help. He just patted, the drunk just patted me on the knee and said, Vernon, you're a good boy. However, he did not think I could understand his case, and he was right. I could not. I found a man who had been an old drunken bum before coming to Christ and asked him to see this man. He went to his home, sat down beside him, and said, Bill, you know, and I used to drink together. Jesus saved me, and he can save you too, and he did. God saved Bill that day. It takes, if the, we always used to say when I, when I was on the patrol, that one drunk can recognize another drunk. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I didn't, that didn't bother me too much at that time when they said it, but now that I'm a Christian, I... I wouldn't like to have that title of being a drunk. God, God our Heavenly Father knows all everything that's going on in our life and so He takes care of us and when we have something in our life that is, that is some disease or some habit or some addiction, whatever it might be, and God has taken that away from us and we're saved, we can help other people who's going through the same situation that we're going through because we know how they're feeling the man or woman who has been through the experience themselves are the ones who can help others I said 11, th 11 things I had down here but when I was uh, going over tonight I, I put a fourth one or a twelfth one on here that these 11 things are indicators that we are starting to slide or are sliding or have slipped. Number one, when I begin to act as if genuine joy is dependent on the state of the circumstances surrounding me. When I begin to act as if genuine joy is dependent on the state of the circumstances surrounding me. As a child of God and you as a child of God, we can be going through some terrible, terrible times. A loved one has passed on. Someone in the family has some terrible disease. We're not happy about it. But praise God, we still have joy. The circumstances does not take away the joy of a Christian. If I find myself thinking that, that, that I've lost my joy because my circumstances are so bad, I'm starting to slip. Starting to slip. My joy depends upon God Almighty. I have that. Unspeakable, unspeakable joy. I have that. Thank God for it. Paul said, when he was surrounded on every side by circumstances, he said, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Thank God. My joy does not depend upon my circumstances. If they start to do that, I'm starting to slip. Number two, when I begin to lose the distinct aroma of the fragrance of Christ in my life, get a little bit grumpy, out of sorts, especially with your wife or your husband. We see at first, I sure don't have the fragrance of Jesus when that happens. i use my wife as an example again. You say, you mean you guys argue? 
Yeah, we argue. <laughs> and, you know, it's usually, usually the, the, you have a big argument, and then you just pfft, shut up. Don't speak to each other for two or three days. Just walk around the house and try to avoid going this way, going that way. <laughs> just uh, get grumpy, out of sorts. When that happens, I'm all around sliding real fast down that hill. Backsliding, backsliding. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. You know what that's saying? That there's absolutely nothing that my wife can do that I, would, that I should get mad or displeased with what she's doing. Nothing. Nothing. Yet, we should love our wives that much. If we're not... We're starting to slip. Fellas, better put on some track shoes, get a little traction. Okay. Number three, when I begin to feel or act as if my self-worth and acceptance is dependent on how well I perform. Do you get that? When I begin to feel or act as if my self-worth and acceptance is dependent on how well I perform. We get in a hurry. Pride swells with inside. Proverbs 16, 18, Brother Bill mentioned that this morning. Pride goeth before destruction. Remember Elijah and the story? He's going to call down fire from heaven. And he lets the prophets of Baal, they're going to call down first. They put the barrels of water on there and the, and the uh, oxen that they'd cut up. And of, they're going to have fire come down. They did that all day and, and just prayed and cut themselves and everything. And Elijah got a little bit prideful. He started mocking them, mocking what they could not do. As soon as this was all over, he was on the run from Jezebel. Well, he, he was all, man, I'm strong. I got God here and, and God's doing it. And those guys, they don't know what they're doing. And then he lets this woman, pride. Well, when we get so big, we think that nothing can happen. Watch out. We're starting to backslide. Amen. When I am losing my grip on reality of spiritual warfare... Then I begin to treat my brother or my fellow human beings as my enemy and seek to do battle with fleshly weapons. Brotherly love gone. My favorite. <clears throat> do you ever drive down the road? I mean, you're going 60 miles an hour and somebody pulls out in front of you and goes five miles an hour? <laughs> then turns off about 20 feet? I say, you dummy. But that's not what I'm thinking. Backsliding. Good friend of mine called that Christian cussing. Christian cussing. When I act as if victory or success depends on me and my ability rather than on the adequacy of God and the power of the Holy Spirit... When I act as if victory or success depends on me or my ability and not God, I am sliding off a fast, going down that hill, no brakes. Brother, we better be able to stop. God has his purpose and his plan, and it's going to, it's going to get completed no matter what I do. What I do, I... I God might use me to do that, but I, God don't have to use me. He can use somebody else. My Victory doesn't depend upon me. Victory depends upon God. For uh, Philippians 4.13, the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. I can do nothing apart from Jesus Christ. No matter what I try, spiritually without Jesus Christ, it amounts to absolutely nothing. 
I don't care how much, how much practice, how much reading, how much studying, how much you're doing. If it's done in the flesh without Jesus Christ, it don't mount to a hill of beans. And the Bible says it'll be wood, hay, or stubble and be burned up when it's tried. Nothing. I can do nothing apart from Jesus Christ that will last for a amount to anything. Bible says in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Nothing. It is his victory. Men and women come and go, but God's church continues. Praise God. Matthew 16, 18, And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter. And upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. All the authority. In those days, they, the people in authority gathered at the gate and made all the decision. The Bible says that the gates, all the authority that the devil has, he can't stop the, the church of the living God. Amen? Next one. I forget what number it is. When I place undue emphasis on programming and planning to the exclusion of his direction, leading, and guidance. I need not get ahead of God or I need not get behind God. Let him take care. When we, when we put so much emphasis on programming and planning, with leaving God out of the decisions that we make. Brother, we are going downhill in a hurry. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. When more time is spent in the activity arena than in the prayer closet. Prayer is probably the least thing that we do as a Christian. My wife, God bless her, she, can't, she doesn't sleep a lot, but she prays a lot. We, we pray through the Bible every year. She goes through it about three times, and I ain't got through it once yet. She reads high as maybe 26 chapters at a time. She can't sleep. I told her that's the reason. But she, she loves the Word of God, and she prays. And how, how we need to pray. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. When more time is spent in the activity arena than in the prior closet, the Bible says, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. You know, that's not hard to do. That's not hard to do. You don't have to close your eyes. You can be walking or be up in a tree stand or fishing or whatever you're doing. You can still pray. Still pray and talk to our Lord. Pray without ceasing. When we find ourselves that we can go through a day or even, even if we could go through a half a day, without praying, without talking to our Father in heaven, we're backsliding. We're sliding. When our earthly fathers are up on this earth, it mine's in heaven, but, you know, I talk to him every day, and he talked to me. I was right there with him. If, if something was wrong, if I'd done something wrong, I didn't want to talk to him. If I, you know, I'd want to stay out of his way. But our Heavenly Father, I need to talk to him every day, all day, as much as possible. If I don't, I'm starting to slide. 1 Timothy 2.8, 
I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. When the praises of men and women become more important than the approval of God. When the praises of men and women become more important than the approval of God. The Apostle Paul addressed that. We need to please God and not please men. When, when I, I, I preach in the prison, I don't, I don't uh, try to preach a message that they would like. I don't try to please them by what I say. I try to preach the word of God. And sometimes we have, I mean, you have seen it, some of the uh, television, uh, I don't want to call them preachers, but some of them on television, I mean, the only thing that you can see, the only thing they're worried about, if I, can, if I can get you comfortable enough to send me 50 bucks, boy, that's all I want. Paul said in Galatians 1.10, For I do not, for, for do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Paul made it very plain there. He says, if my, if my intentions, if what I'm doing, the, the preaching, if I'm doing to please some man, he said, then I should not be a servant of our, my God, Jesus Christ. And I don't think we should be either if, we, if that's what we're trying to do. When relating to caring for people is less important than programs, planning, meetings, and budgets. Things should never take place over our relationship with one of another, loving each other. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty eight, besides those things that are besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. You imagine that? The Apostle Paul here in 2 Corinthians is defending his apostleship. And a lot of them didn't believe that he was an apostle, a true apostle. And he tells them all the things he did. And you, you, you read about it, his shipwrecked uh, in the deep for a day and a night and, and uh, bitten by a viper and all that that he went through. But he, but he says here, says, I love this. Besides those things that are without, talking about without the church, the things that he had to do, every going here, going there and daily. He says, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. And you think of all the churches the Apostle Paul took, uh, started. He says, the care falls upon me daily. Now, brother, that's busy. That's doing what God would have us to do. Putting, putting the care of the churches before the planning and, and, and the other things that... Uh, uh, should not should not be have priority when I assume responsibility to worry and fret over things and people that God and his sovereignty and power would take care of if I would allow him to do so I, I say I, I slip down a little bit on that one I start sliding sometimes we we feel that I can take care of this. I can, I can do it. I can, I can, I can, I can do whatever, whatever, whatever this is, I can handle it. When all I have to do is go to my Heavenly Father and ask Him to help me in this area. You know, He does. He does. There's a lot of things that we put on our back, put on our shoulders, that God can take care of. I heard this little preacher, little black preacher, 
He said, where the Bible said, cast all your care upon me, for I care for he careth for you. He says, most of us, is like we're going fishing. We put our care on the end of that hook. We throw it out. We reel it right back in. And it gets a little heavy again, then we throw it out again. But uh, I can take care of it. And we roll it right back in again. God says that he can take care of the problems and difficulties that we have if we will just ask him. Some things God will take care of. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Battles are sometimes better to be let the Lord fight. And we watch him work. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will shew, thee, shew to you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. Can you believe that? God says, These Egyptians that you have seen today, says, you're never going to see them again. Now, that, that takes a little bit more than just in this world. I mean, because they're going, the, the uh, Israelites, they're going to go to heaven. But God says, the Egyptians not going to be there. You're not going to see them forever again. Praise God. When my rights become more important than God's will and way. When my rights become more important than God's will and way. You hear that a lot today. I have a right to that. That's my rights. When I, when I say that what I want, my rights, other than the will of God, boy, I am going down in a hurry, sliding fast. God's will should be done in every circumstance. Jonah wanted it his way and got mad because did it, God did it his way. Christ did that which was what his Father's will. The Bible says in Luke twenty-two forty-two, 42, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. One more. I just wrote this one down. When I find myself staying out of church, when I am able to be there. When I find myself staying out of church, when I'm able to be there. If you have been saved very long, you, you see people that they start missing Sunday school, then Sunday evening, still come on Sunday morning, then Wednesday evening, you don't see them. Pretty soon, you don't see them on Sunday morning. When I find myself staying out of church, when I am able to be there, Hebrews 10.25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. When Judy and I got saved, we made a promise to God that we would be in church every time the doors were open. Sunday morning comes, we don't have to make a decision. We made it year, 42 years ago. Wednesday night come, we don't have to make a decision. We made it 42 years ago. Sunday school come, we don't have to make a decision. We did it 42 years ago. If you find yourself staying away from church just because you don't feel like going, watch out. Because there might be a time to say, well, I'm just not going to go, period. Father, we love you, praise you, and thank you for all that you do. Father, thank you for your word, and thank you, Father, for these indicators that 
we might see where we're falling short of doing what you would have us to do. And I just pray tonight, Lord, if some here saw some things in their life that they need to get straightened out, God, I pray that they would get it, get in touch with you tonight, Lord, and just get that straightened out. In Jesus' precious and holy name I pray. Amen.